Jeremiah 4 and 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Jerubal, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. That's what Sister Debbie was just leading us in. We've got the power not by our power, not by our might, not by our strength, but we've already found out the prophet Zechariah knew what he was talking about. Zechariah 9 and 9, he said the Lord's going to come into town riding on a donkey. Yeah. What happened? The Lord came into town riding on a donkey. He said the Lord shall come back and he shall place his foot on the Mount of Olives. What's going to happen? The Lord is going to do that. That's going to happen. So Zechariah is a liable source. Can I get an amen there? Amen. He is a liable source. And he said, he spoke these words. He said, then he answered and spake unto me, saying, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, this is meaning that Zechariah heard from the Lord. Aren't you glad to know that men of God can still hear from the Lord as Zechariah did? He said, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. He's now letting us know this, this scripture has been a strength to me for many years. This scripture no doubt has been a strength to many others to realize it's not by my ability, not by what I possess, not by my talents. I, I used to come to the pulpit when I was evangelized and I would come to the pulpit and I would make this statement. I said, when you look at me, you may say, I haven't seen much. So when you hear me and after I'm done, you may say, well, I haven't heard much. I said, but when God looks down, He sees me as the one that He's called for a purpose. When He looks down at me, He says, that's my beloved Son doing what I've called Him to do. And He is well pleased. Yeah. That sounds pretty good, don't it? Good theory. I had a pastor correct me one time. He pulled me aside. He said, Brother Jimmy, I wish you wouldn't say that when you go to the pulpit. I understand what you're saying. He said, but let me tell you something, son. God has anointed you with abilities. God has given you an ability that others does not have. God had a purpose and a plan for your life. He has given you abilities. And He's anointed you with those abilities. And He's given you those abilities. And I know what you're saying. You're saying that you depend solely upon the anointing. I understand that. But God will take your ability. He will take, He will use your might and your power. But when it's all said and done, it's not going to be our might or our power or our ability. Our Even our God given ability. It's not going to be that. It's going to be by the Spirit of the Lord. That God will accomplish what He wants to accomplish through us and in us. So use those abilities that you have for the Lord. When God takes and He mixes that ability that He's given you and He takes the Spirit and the anointing of the Holy Ghost and puts it upon you, great things are going to be accomplished for the kingdom world. I did not look at the Sunday school lesson this week. Sister May called me uh, later this week. I guess it may have been yesterday. She called me and asked me if I looked at the Sunday school lesson. I felt like the teacher was calling me and asking me if I looked at my lesson. I'm in college now, and I, I get some emails from my teachers wanting to know if we've uh, looked at our lesson. I said, oh, no, I've got a teacher calling that. No, ma'am, I have not looked at the lesson this week. And I, and I do that purposely. I, I don't look at the lesson during the week. I, I, I just don't do that. I look at it on Sunday morning sometime, early in the morning. I'll, I'll look at the text and the title. But I, I don't want the, my mind to get wrapped around that and me begin to entangle my thoughts into that and tie it into my message on my own. But when God does it, then I know that it's what He wanted for the service today. So... The Lord did lay upon my heart early this week, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want us to look there this morning. I know you're used to Brother Jamie saying, turn to 1 Corinthians and then put your finger there and turn to Genesis. Put your finger there and turn to Galatians. But we're just going to look at this one chapter this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Hold on, put your seatbelt on, take your seatbelt off, whatever you want to do. But there's 58 verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm not going anywhere else in the Bible, but I am walking through 1 Corinthians 15. 
this morning. Go look at verse 51, 52 for a text this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 51. It says, Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That verse starts out, Behold, I shew you a mystery. Anybody ever read Hardy Boy mystery books when they were in school? We used to read it. It was a mystery. Seemed like in the mystery books, the butler always did it. It's a mystery. They try to figure it out. The whole book, the whole movie, and mysteries, the whole time is spent trying to do what? Trying to figure it out. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be change. The end of verse 52 says that we shall be changed. I want to preach this morning message entitled, Change is Coming. Change is Coming. Stretch your hands towards heaven. Let's ask God to touch us this morning. Heavenly Father, so grateful to you today for your blessing. So thankful for your spirit, for your power, for your anointing. Dear God, this is real in our hearts and our lives. And in this place, dear God, Almighty God, you're faithful, and Lord God, and you're our strength, and you're our help, and our hope today, Lord. And we just thank you for what's going to be accomplished in this house today, dear God. What's going to be accomplished in the Word of God today. And I just ask you, Heavenly Father, to touch every heart, every life, every mind, and every soul, and draw us ever closer to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Quick commercial next Sunday night, our fifth Sunday sing. Everybody that sings, be ready to sing next Sunday night. We're going to do it here in the sanctuary. We're going to have rec start at regular church time, and uh, we'll do it here in the sanctuary next Sunday night. So don't forget to bring your finger foods and your uh, birthday celebration stuff because it, it's also the end of the month, birthday and anniversary celebration. The writer here in 1 Corinthians, Paul sharing with the Corinthians here, he said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Don't you love the confidence that the men of God that bent the Word of God wrote with? Uh, these men of God, they wrote with such confidence, using uh, such words as shall, and it's going to be. Uh, they, they don't come in the, the prophets, as we've been studying in Sunday school uh, over, those, over these past few weeks, uh, about these minor prophets. Uh, I, I just started a college class this week on the minor prophets. Uh, and one thing I've already learned, and already knew before this, but they recapped it there in our introduction, there is nothing minor about the minor prophets. Uh, there's nothing minor about these men. These were powerful men of God. Uh, Peter was a powerful man of God that stepped out on the day of Pentecost, uh, preached for three minutes and saw 3,000 saved. Uh, those disciples that were there with him on that day uh, were powerful men of God. There were men that depended upon the strength of God. How do you know that, Brother Jamie? Because there's no way uh, that a 11 men can baptize 3,000 men and women uh, in one day uh, and not be worn out, tired to a frazzle. Uh, but these men baptized 3,000 in one day. Uh, then they left there. The Word of God tells us uh, that they did this, that they turned the world uh, upside down. Uh, these men of God, they not only turned their world upside down, uh, but thank God, they took time uh, for the way to hear from the Lord uh, and took the quill in their hand and dipped it in that ink and begin to write down what the Lord spoke to them. And Paul, even in prison, he began to take out a sheet of paper and he began to take out a pen and he began to write. I don't know if any of you have ever got any letters from people in prison or not, but I've never got any letters like the ones that Paul sent and from anybody in prison before. Paul began to pen and he began to write there. He began to write about life. He began to write write about the power of God. Uh, he began to write about how he uh, joys in the stripes that 
54. Uh, he began to sing. Him and Silas uh, began to sing in the midnight hour. Uh, how in the world can Paul uh, write such uh, challenging words? How in the world can Paul uh, write such encouraging words while straps are upon his back? Uh, and how in the world can he uh, look at his buddy Silas and say, you pray a while. Uh, I'll sing a while. Uh, and then I'll pray a while. Uh, and you sing a while. Uh, how in the world can he do this? Uh, because the same confidence that he wrote with uh, here and the same confidence that you'll find that he wrote with uh, throughout the New Testament uh, was the same confidence that he stood upon. Uh, he said, I know uh, that this corruptible uh, shall put on incorruptible. Uh, beat this flesh if you want to. Uh, scar it up if you want to. Uh, he said, do whatever you want to with this flesh uh, that I know uh, that change is coming. He said, I'm going to be changed. In less time than a split second, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, as the last trump of the Lord shall sound, we shall be changed. 1 Corinthians 15 starts out in verse number 1. And it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which ye also are saved, if you keep in memory that what I preached unto you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Well, there's a lot just right there in those first three verses. We cannot begin to digest what Paul wrote there in those first three verses of Scripture. I couldn't put it in a blender this morning and break it down and force you this, what Paul is saying just in those first three Scriptures. But I want to look at it this morning. Now, Paul's writing now. Remember this. He's writing a letter to the Corinthians. Now, obviously, he's preached for them before uh, because he said, Moreover, brethren, I, I declare unto you a gospel which I preached unto you. What is he saying? He said, I'm going to write you today to remind you something that I've already preached to you. I want to remind you of something that I've already shared with you, uh, that I've already already told you. Uh, he said, would you also have received wherein you stand? Uh, he said, you received it, now you stand proclaiming to be uh, a Christian. You have received the Word of God. Uh, Paul said, I preached to some of you. Uh, I preached to all of you, and some of you came to an altar, uh, and you prayed through, you repented. Uh, you came to that meeting place with God. Uh, he said, and guess what happened there? Uh, you were changed. How do we know that? Because the Word of God says, if any man be in Christ, uh, He's a new creation. Uh, all things are passed away. Uh, all things become new. Uh, so Paul starts out here in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 by saying, Brethren, I declare unto you uh, the gospel which I preached unto you, uh, and you have also received it, uh, and now you stand. Uh, let me tell you something. Just as Paul said, just as Paul wrote there, uh, I've got to say this morning, uh, along with many pastors, we stand in the pulpit, uh, and we say we're not preaching some new gospel gospel to you. Uh, this isn't some new thing. Uh, sometimes people look at me like they don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, like it's the first time they've ever heard it. Uh, but it's just a reminder that Paul is giving them there. Uh, in Corinthians, it's a reminder that God is giving to us today. Uh, he said, I'm not preaching something new. Uh, I'm not sharing with you something new. But it's something that you stand upon, that you have stood upon. He said, by which also ye are saved. Through this word yes. that we're saved. It's through this word that we've received strength, we receive power. How many this morning remember the verses where Jesus spoke about two men, a wise man and a foolish man? One built his house upon the rock, another built his house upon the sand. Anybody remember that story? Yeah. Let me see your hand. I want to see your hand. You remember that story? He said, one built his house upon the rock. One built his house upon the sand. He said, now you've received it. You stand therein by which also you're saved. We're saved because what? Because we built upon the rock. And what did Jesus tell Peter about being built upon a rock? He said, upon this, upon this rock, I've done what? I've built my church. Amen. Because he was the wise master builder. Amen. His, his daddy, his earthly daddy, was a carpenter. 
So Jesus knew about carpentry. He knew about plumb lines. Uh, he knew about all of those wonderful things. Uh, I guess Hobby Lobby's not that bad. My wife got me a picture uh, from Hobby Lobby, and it's Joseph standing there working uh, at his bench, and uh, there playing on the floor is baby Jesus, and he's got the nails and the hammer and the shadow. The sun comes and casts a shadow upon him, uh, and you see the shadow of the cross. Uh, there's a beautiful saying that goes along with that picture. Uh, though he was Joseph's son, uh, there in the earthly, in the fleshly, in the eyes of man, uh, there was something that people could only see uh, when the light of God shone upon him that cross uh, that he was to bear. He knew about carpentry. Uh, he was there at that carpentry shop. Uh, that's why he spoke uh, about building a house. He said one will build his house upon the rock uh, and one will build his house on the sand. Uh, many hands went up all over this house this morning and said, I, I've heard that story. I know that story. Uh, but Paul right here he said, by which you also uh, are saved. Uh, have we built our relationship uh, upon the moral to that story? Does anybody know the moral to the story? You build your house on sand. Shifting sand is going to what? Fall. And not only fall, but what's going to happen? Great is the fall. When we build our house upon anything less than the solid rock. So Paul said, I'm not writing something new to you. I'm writing something to you that I've already preached to you. Uh, but I just felt compelled uh, of the Spirit of God to remind you today uh, that you've been called. You've received what I preached to you. Uh, and you know that this is the foundation on which you're saved. Uh, you built your whole life on it. Uh, he said, upon this rock I will build my church uh, and the gates of hell shall not uh, prevail uh, against it. Uh, he said, you built your whole life on nothing else but the rock. My faith, your faith is in Jesus Christ. He said we've got this faith and this confidence in the Lord and you've made up your mind. I'm putting all the sign. I'm putting all the sign. What did Jesus say to him when he came to him? I saw this picture this week and it said that Jesus sitting down beside a man on a park bench. He said, no, I wasn't talking about Twitter when I said I really want you to follow me. And then Jesus does not want us to follow him on Twitter. He wants us to follow him with our life. When he looked at those disciples. He said, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. He said, you've heard those words of follow me. You've heard those words of a solid foundation. I preached to you Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Well, how do you know that's what Paul was saying, Brother Daniel? Because Paul said and he taught, preached nothing else but Jesus and Him crucified. And I guarantee you, Paul was teaching it. That's what Paul was preaching. If he was preaching it, he was living it. Why? Because he was a man of God. And he said, listen, folks, you've been living it. You've turned your life over to it. you surrendered to it. If you keep in memory that that I preached unto you. Hold on a minute. He said, I preached it. You received it. You stood upon it. And you stand upon it. He said, you've also been saved if you keep in memory that which I preached unto you. Thus you have believed in vain. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Paul said, I preached to you about the power of the gospel. I preached to you about the transforming power of God. That there's a change that's coming. Uh, there's a day when this, this corruptible is going to put up incorruptible. When this house of flesh uh, it is going to rot and it's going to decay. Uh, but soon he said you're going to be called to meet me in the air. Uh, and the word of God says we shall be like him. Uh, Paul said that's coming. Uh, he said I preached it to you. I've laid it out for you. Uh, you said you understood it. You said you received it. Uh, he said and you're saved by that. Uh, it's that simple folks. We receive it. We receive it, we believe it, we confess it, and it's ours. And we believe it and hold fast to it. We stand upon it. We say, no longer am I going to use the sand. I'm coming over here. Well, you got a house half built over there. I don't care. I'm neglecting that old house of flesh. I'm putting on this new house. I love that song. It's the best thing I ever did do. I took off the old coat and I put on the new. He said, I've come over here and I'm doing the Upon the solid foundation, Paul said, "You're doing good, friends. You're doing good, child of God. You believed it. You received it. You're saved by it. You're loving God. You're loving people. You're living the life. You're faithful and true." But he said, "If you continue to believe." 
believe what I preached unto you. He said, if you continue to believe it, he said, unless you believe in vain. What's he talking about? We believed in vain when we say we believed it, that our actions show otherwise. Paul, yeah. oh, I believe that you need to be built upon the rock. I believe that he is the only way. I believe that that house upon the rock is the only way. But people say, you're still living over here in this house on the sand. He said, that's what's going to happen. It's going to be in vain. Your words are going to be vain. They're going to be shallow. They're going to be empty. Dropping down to verse 19. He said, verse 19. Excuse me. I'm not ready to drop the 19 yet. Hold on. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Don't preach to me. Don't teach me something you have received from God yourself. Amen. I used to hate it when I would go to seminars for work or when, when I'd come home to a job and uh, they, they hired, put some boss man in place uh, and, and they came in. And they come in, they don't know anything about the industry, don't know anything uh, about what we're doing. They come in supposed to lead me, uh, supposed to teach me. Anybody else ever been there? Uh, they, they bring them in, they come in, they have these seminars uh, and they bring somebody in for a seminar uh, and some from other, some other line of work. Uh, I've seen this in the ministerial internship program. Program. Uh, they brought some carnal man uh, that is out there in the world, brought him in to talk to ministers about ministry. Uh, you can't tell me nothing about ministry. Uh, you don't know anything about ministry. You have not believed it. You have not received it. Uh, Paul said, I'm not preaching to you something I haven't believed. Uh, I'm not preaching to you something I haven't received. Uh, because you can find many times uh, that he's there. He's prophesying. Uh, he's witnessing. Excuse me. He's testifying. Uh, and he's sharing his testimony. Uh, you can find where he's there standing before. King Agrippa. He said, oh, King, I was there on that road to Damascus. I thought I was doing good living by every letter of the law. I thought I was a right man, an upright man, a Pharisees of Pharisees. I was a good man living by the law. So I thought, he said, then the light of the Lord shone down and knocked me off my beast and struck me part. I said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord spoke to me and said, go, and then an eyes will pray for you, and I will open your eyes. And he said, Paul, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. I'm going to send you to Rome. Paul, I'm going to bring a change in your life. Paul knew about change. He knew what he was talking about when he said change is coming. He said, I'm not writing to you and I'm not preaching to you something that I don't believe. He said, first of all, that which I also believe, now that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. I read it. I received it. I believe it. Gatorade says, is it in you? Paul said, man, it's in me. And he's got to come out. It can't stay in me. See, when you drink Gatorade, you want it to stay in you because it gives all those nutrients of the body. But when you get the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God in you, you, you don't want it just to stay in you. You want it to be able to flow from you. Uh, he said, I will put within you. What did he tell the woman in the well? Uh, come on, folks. He told the woman in the well. He said, I'll put a well springing forth life. Uh, when we get the rubble out of your belly, uh, he said, I'll be life eternal. You'll never have to go back to that well again. Uh, you have living water uh, flowing from within. That's what Paul said. He said, I've received it. I believe it. I preach it now. I'm writing to you, man. I've got something to tell you. I, listen up. I've got something to tell you. In verse 19, uh, he said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. No doubt Paul was in a, probably in a miserable place when he was reading these words. Uh, he was probably not sitting there in a luxurious place uh, when he penned these words. Uh, he said, if I begin to look around me, uh, if I begin to put hope in this life, uh, if I begin to put confidence in man, uh, if I begin to put confidence in this world, uh, he said, if you begin to put confidence in man in this world, uh, you're going to be a miserable people. This life is going to bring you misery, heartache, and pain. Paul said, hold on. Change is coming. Anybody ever wake up just feeling miserable? Change is coming. If you receive the Word of God and you believe in it and you stand upon it, you live in it day by day, holding fast to it, it's become your everything. I love Brother Greg Atkins. You have to know Brother Greg Atkins. You love him too. He came to our church just as a teenager, getting up there singing, 
could barely sing, huh? but he could shout it and holler. And he's a great singer today. He kept practicing. Huh? But he sung. He got up there and he sung. Uh, Brother Wayne, just a young man. I guess he was probably 16, 17 years old. Huh? He got saved at 14 years old. Nobody in his family was saved, but he got saved. Huh? And he came through that revival. He began to sing this song. To me, he's become everything. Huh? He's everything that I need. Huh? Man, the power of God fell in that youth service. Huh? Young people began to flood the altar. Huh? Was it because Brother Grant? was singing a great song uh, with, with great ability and a great voice. No, he was an old uh, country boy from Alabama uh, and he has an Alabama twang and he was just singing uh, the best he could but the anointing. Uh, he was singing with all of his ability and then the anointing came in uh, and began to flow and what made that song so powerful? Uh, before he sung, he shared his testimony. Uh, he said, I got saved. Uh, Mama didn't get saved. Daddy didn't get saved. Uh, but I got saved. Uh, he said, when I got saved, I found a way to church. Uh, I found a way to the house of God. He said, I'm 14 years old. I get myself up in the morning and get dressed and go to the house of God while everybody else in the house was sleeping. He said, but something happened inside of me. He became my all and my whole. He became my everything. He said, I met down in the word of God when he said to go into your prayer closet when you pray and clean out the closet, get in there, close the door and begin to pray. He said, well, I took it literally. I went in there and I took all my clothes uh, out of the closet uh, and I got in there. Mama came in there one day. Uh, Greg, where you at? Uh, and she opened the door and there's Greg, uh, 14 years old, big boy, uh, laying in the floor, crying out to God uh, in that prayer closet. Uh, he said he became everything to me. That's what Paul's saying. You have hope only in this life. Oh, Greg, if he could go by statistics, uh, many like Greg, if you went by statistics, there's no hope, there's no help uh, for somebody like that young man. Uh, it's an endless battle. Uh, but Brother Greg can tell you as he's pastoring that church in Alabama today, uh, they've outgrown their building. Uh, they've got a second campus that they're starting uh, by another building. Uh, I planted seed in that ministry. I'm sending money uh, to help me a part of that uh, because souls are being saved. Uh, lives are being changed. And guess who? Some of those souls. That are being saved. I was watching a camp meeting service. Brother Greg was preaching here just last week. And he said, Daddy, come up and help me with a song. His daddy got saved. And in that song, his daddy was saying, and the, what the singers were saying, I don't know. Uh, what the preacher was preaching, he said, I, I can question it. I'm not really sure. Uh, he said, but I know there was a voice that called me down to an altar. Uh, he said, I knelt down to that altar uh, and a change uh, took place. Uh, friend, if you want it, uh, change will come. We don't have to wait on the rapture. Uh, change can happen in your life now. Uh, if you can only make him your everything. Uh, and Paul said, if you put your heart only uh, in this life, in this flesh, uh, in this house of clay, uh, you're going to be among all the most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead. See, that's not something just to take life. We can't just read over that and say, oh, thank God. But he said, if you have hope only in this life, you'll be among all men most miserable. Why did Jesus come to the cross? Because life was miserable. Writer in Hebrews said the bulls of goats and rams, the blood of both goats and rams and bulls, sheep, pearl doves, none of that would suffice any longer. Right. That high priest going in and offering that sin sacrifice once a year wasn't working. Right. After four years of silence, 400 years of silence, there had to come an answer. There had to come a change. It wasn't a high priest taking a sacrifice into the Holy of Holies. No, that wasn't going to work. Scripture tells us that the Father looked over heaven. And Jesus became that ultimate sacrifice for you and me. Why did he have to become that ultimate sacrifice for you and me? Because life was miserable. Life became miserable. Sin was on a rampage. Sound familiar? Destruction everywhere you look. Heartache, pain, and trouble. He said there, if we had hope only in this life, we'd be most miserable. All men most miserable. But now, it's Christ risen from the dead. Living, he loved him. Dying, he saved him. Buried, he carried my sins 
far away. Here's the good part. Rising, he justified. Oh, you didn't hear me. Rising, he justified. Free me forever. Rising, he justified. Free me forever. If you didn't get it, I could say it 20 more times and you still wouldn't get it. One day, he's coming back. Right. One glorious day. Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. This flesh thing, like, guess what? Adam died. Paul, the great man he was, guess what? He died. Peter, zealous Peter. Peter, that got full of the Holy Ghost, stepped out of the day of Pentecost and preached to 3,000 souls to salvation. He died. As a matter of fact, he was crucified upside down. Yeah. Eleven of the twelve disciples were martyred. Only one died a natural death. But they all died. They were boiled in oil. They were burned at the stake. They were crucified. They were all of these things. This flesh died. But he said, as all in this Adam flesh and nature die, all those in the spirit shall be made alive. Amen. Verse 47. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. A lot of earthies in those verses of Scripture. But do you understand what Paul is saying? Be honest with me. If you don't understand, lift your hand. If you don't understand what that verse of Scripture is saying, lift your hand. Just be honest. It's all right. Because I didn't understand when I first read it. There was too many earthies for me. He said, the first man is of the earth, earth, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. Is this earth, such also are the earthy, and is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heaven. Jesus. People look at my son all the time, and they tell him, oh, you look just like your dad. People look at me and they tell me, you look just like your dad. We bear the image of the earth. This physical image. My whole life, Noah's whole life, he's going to hear, you look like your daddy. And that's always followed up with, you're a good looking young man for some reason. <laughs> Not me, they said it. I didn't. But his whole life, we're going to bear that image of the earth. When I got saved, Guess what? Didn't change my image. Didn't change this fleshly image. Didn't change the way this flesh looks. All of a sudden things took place on the inside that changed and made me alive. And I'm reminded of another song. I love songs, you know. There's Jesus on the inside. Flowing. On the outside, there's been a change in me. The Holy Ghost on the inside, flowing on the outside, there's been a change in me. Sanctified on the inside, it shows up on the outside, there's been a change in me. I still got the same smile when I did smile. I still got the same smile. Still got the same color eyes. I still got the same big ears and the same big nose uh, and the same goofy cowlick hair. I, I still got all of that uh, that I had before I got saved. I still got that image of, of Adam on the outside. Uh, but oh, thank God when He sees me, He don't see me as I am. Uh, but He sees the blood that He shed for me at Calvary. Uh, it rises. He justified, uh, freed me forever. Uh, and he 
cleansed me, uh, that he washed me, uh, that he changed something inside of me, uh, and when he changed something inside of me, it made me uh, want to begin to change some things about the outside of me. Uh, it made me want to change uh, the way I acted. It made me want to change uh, the way that I talked. Uh, it made me want to change uh, the things that I was doing, the places that I was going, uh, the clothes that I was wearing, uh, the things that I was putting on. Uh, it made me want to change. What it did to me, it made me get a pair of, a pair of uh, needle nose pliers and try to break off the earring that was in my ear because I couldn't get the back off of it. There was a change that took place. Uh, I had to take it off. Uh, it made me want to jerk off all those things in the world. Uh, it changed me. Uh, it changed something deep inside, deep down inside me. Uh, he said, just as in this flesh, we're all going to die. Uh, he said, and in this, uh, this uh, same spirit of Christ is in us, uh, we're going to be made alive. That's why I love Pentecost. Because we believe in worshiping like we're alive. It's a living God that we serve. My God's not dead. He's still alive. My God is not in a tomb. My God's not hanging on the cross. I love what the cross represents. I love the fact that He went to the cross for me. But I could not stand to see a crucifix where they still had him on the cross. He's not on the cross anymore, friend. I know what it represents. I know what they're trying to bring across. But he take my Jesus off the cross. He's not on the cross anymore. I don't remember him on the cross. I like to remember the cross like this. That cross is empty. He's not there. I, I want to go take you to the grave. I, he, hey, guess what? I, the angel said, he's not here. He is rich. Why seek you the living among the dead? I, why are we going to seek for a living Christ uh, hanging on a cross or seek for a living Christ uh, in an empty tomb? He's not there. Uh, that's why it's so when you see all these good things begin to take place, uh, look up. Uh, change is coming. Uh, look up. Your redemption drawing. Uh, I was somebody who would get excited with me in this place this morning and know uh, that he's coming back uh, and change is coming with him. Hallelujah. Lord. Our text said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, in the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. I believe old Gabriel is licking his lips. Yeah. Amen. I believe somebody said this morning that the trump is hanging there on the wall and he's reaching for it. I believe that's about the, I believe that he's stepping up there and he's getting in position. I don't know how long Gabriel's been standing there, but I believe he's been standing there for a while. Is it time yet? Because he don't know the time. He don't know when he's supposed to blow that trumpet. Now, he may know that he is supposed to be the one. He may not know that he's the designated one to blow that trumpet, but the Word of God tells us that he's going to blow that trumpet. Uh, and when he blows that trumpet, uh, the dead in Christ is going to rise first, and then we that are alive and remain are going to be caught up to meet with the air. The trumpet's going to sound, uh, and this corruptible is going to put on incorrupt. Change is coming. It's coming. <coughs> we shall be change. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Getting ready to blow that trumpet. Praise your name, Lord. Are you ready? Thank Where would you be if that trumpet already sounded? Would you be worried about the tribulation? Who's the Antichrist? A lot of people today are worried, worried about who the Antichrist is. Some have said he's already been born. He's already here. I believe that. I believe he's already on the face of this earth. I believe that to be true. The spirit of Antichrist has already come. Yeah. The spirit of Antichrist came all the way back in Bible time. It's been here. The spirit of Antichrist yeah. is already there. That's anything that separates and pulls away from God. Yeah. And that spirit of Antichrist is already present. And I'm not going to be worried about sitting around wondering if, if what's going to happen when they come to me and they tell me if I want something to eat, I've got to take this mark in my hand or in my forehead. Am I going to be able to do it? Am I going to be able to stand for Christ? Am I going to be able to do it? Sister May made a valid point in Sunday school at that time. Brother Charles I recapped that. He said the Spirit of God is going to be removed, withdrawn from the face of this earth. My word tells me that no man comes unto the Father unless the Spirit draws him. If you're going to make it through the tribulation, it's going to be sheer faith. Friend, you're not going to feel the convicting power of the 
the Holy Ghost. Uh, you're not going to feel God drawing you to an altar of repentance uh, because His Spirit is departed. The Holy Ghost is gone. The presence of God is gone. Uh, it's just the devil and the Antichrist having himself a ball. Uh, it's going to be pure faith to say no. Uh, take my head if you want to. Uh, and if we can't live for God now with the Spirit of God here uh, dealing with us and drawing us and moving us uh, and correcting us uh, in the preached Word of God, uh, coming down from the throne room of grace, uh, convicting our hearts and bring us to an order when we do wrong, uh, the Holy Ghost checking us uh, and pulling on those reins. Whoa! Anybody ever had that happen? That check of the Spirit causes you to flip the channel? That check of the Spirit that calls you to throw that magazine in the trash. Uh, that check of the Spirit that makes you turn your head. Uh, that check of the Spirit that makes you pop yourself in the mouth and say, Lord, forgive me for what I just said. Uh, that check of the Spirit that makes you go and say, Brother Joe, uh, I'm sorry for what I said about you. Uh, that check of the Spirit will be gone. You can't serve him and worship him and live for him now. And as Paul said, what I preach to you, what I share with you, if you can't hold fast to that now, what makes you think that that change is coming to your life? You've heard about it, you know about it, uh, but you can't get excited about it because you know, uh, Brother Jamie is talking about change this morning, uh, that I can't get excited because I'm not confident that I'm going to make it. Is that you this morning? You better be honest with yourself. Because change is coming. In closing this morning, Sister Debbie, if you would like to. Change is coming. I'm not picking on our president with this message. Didn't even think about him until just a few minutes ago. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brother. There's one my beloved brother. Paul's trying to get a point. He said, I'm 57 verses. A long letter he wrote there. 1 Corinthians 15. 57 verses. I don't know how many pages that would have been. But he had a lot to say. We didn't cover all of it. We just hit the highlights of it. Lord brought out to me this week. And in this final verse, he said, Therefore, my beloved, he said, started out with what? Verse 1, what did verse 1 say? I show you what? Okay, we'll start over. Preach it all over again. He said, I show you a mystery. I show you a mystery. I'm just so thankful that he didn't leave him with a mystery. He said, I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. He could have put a period there, folded it up, put it in an envelope, said however they did it. I don't know. They didn't have a U.S. Postal Service there. He could have sent that letter. So I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. That could have been his message. But he didn't stop there. He said, I preached to you. I'm writing it to you again. I'm telling you that Jesus rose from the dead. You receive that. You stand upon that. You believe that. This life, if you had hope, you'd be among all men most miserable. It'd be a miserable life because Christ is risen from the dead. You're justified by faith through Him. You've got something to live for. You've got something to stand upon. You've got something to build upon. It's this great salvation. He said that there's coming a change. And that if you live in this earthly nature of Adam, you expect to, if you expect to, to continue to live like Adam again, be, be, be able to re remember Man, got tongue tied. He said, be able to receive uh, and know and accept that you're going to receive what Adam received. What did Adam receive? He got pushed out of the garden when he lived like Adam. Out of the presence of the Lord, he said, if you want to be like Adam, he can. He was born in that image. We was all born sinners. You have that choice. He said, but no, you're going to die just like Adam died. And that's going to be the end. You're going to burn in eternal flame, in eternal hell. If you stay in that Adam nature. He said, but there was that second man, Adam. And he's brought life. So why don't you live in that life? He said, all of that. And then he said in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved 
forever. This is what we need to hear. If you didn't hear anything else, listen to this. Be ye steadfast. I think I've heard this already this morning. Thank little sister preacher May stood up on her soapbox at the end of Sunday school this morning. It's all right, sis. She said this very same thing. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I heard it. Brother Carl, I heard it. Brother Wayne, I heard it. Brother Buster, I heard it. Brother Joe, I heard it. Did we hear it? Be you steadfast, unmovable, always bound in the work of the Lord. Why? That's what we always ask you. Why? Your kids ever do that to you? Why? You ever do that? Why? We do that a lot in Sunday school class with Sister Mary. What, what, what? Why? Well, here's why. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. See, if you read just 50, verse 58 by itself, you might not get the whole point. But I've heard, heard, read verse 58 a million times, probably. I've read this chapter many times. But just now when I read that, I moved up. Just get me. Look, if you've got your Bible, still open. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2. Just, I mean, Lord, just hit me with this what I call like a ton of bricks. He said, by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you have believed in what? Amen. Vain. He said, lest you have believed it in vain. Now let's read verse 58 again. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You have not believed in vain if you held fast, if you hold to it, if held holding on to it, and trusting in it. If you're living a life, let it mock you. If you're living a clean life and a pure life, and you're still saying it's holiness or hell, if you're still saying I'm not going to compromise, if you're still standing for the truth. Uh, if you're still saying, I believe in walking right, spitting right. Uh, I believe that it takes the uh, whole word of God. I believe it takes us dressing right, going to the right places, uh, leaving the world alone. Uh, if you still have took a stand for holiness, for godliness, uh, and for righteousness, uh, friend, it is not in vain. Be steadfast. Uh, unmovable. Uh, always, 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 uh, always, uh, always abound in the work of the Lord uh, because change coming. Stand your feet. Stand your feet all over this house. Change is coming. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Some go keep on sleeping. Some keep on sleeping. Some sleep through messages, sleep through Sunday school, sleep through everything God's trying to tell them, everything God's going to share with them. They're going to keep on sleeping. He said, but we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Paul wrote in another place. He said, now is time. He said, knowing the signs of the time, now is time, it's high time that we wake out of sleep. For our salvation is here now and when we first begin. Change is coming. Change is coming. Change is coming. Are you ready for that change? Are you ready for the rapture this morning? If I wasn't ready for this rapture, I wouldn't wait for somebody to call me this altar. I'd be running to this altar right now. Right now in the name of Jesus. Change is coming. Cast off every work of the flesh. Cast off all the works of darkness. Well, Brother Jimmy, I, I know I prayed one time, but there, there's just something in me saying, I don't really know. I'll be getting to this altar, making it sure. 
Make my calling election sure. I hope so. You need to be in this altar. I think so. You need to be in this altar. He said, if you're my friend, you keep my commandments. If you're not keeping the commandments of God, you need to be in this altar. If you're not keeping the commandments and the oracles of God, you don't need to be looking for a position in the church. You need to be looking for a place in the altar. Say, I need to be changed. I need to be changed. Because I want that ultimate change. I want to be like Him. I want to reign with Him. Show your mystery. That millennial reign is kind of mysterious to us. It sounded like in Sunday school this morning. Show your mystery. But all I know is I want to be a part of it. I want to change. So what you're telling me is everybody in this house is ready to go. You're standing with confidence telling me right now, I'm ready. Don't worry about me, Brother Jamie. I'm ready to go. You're telling me that or you're either telling me, Brother Jamie, I don't care. I can care less, buddy. Just say your amen so I can get the poppers before they get packed out. I'm just being real this morning, folks. Brother Wayne said Wednesday night, the only thing, the only way I know is bold. I'm with you, brothers. Only way I know. Because I love you. I love 